In this module, we are going to talk about phase contrast microscopy. So one of the reasons we want to talk about this as a, as a technique is it's good for polymers. So polymers uh, don't have a lot of inherent contrast to them. Uh, so bright field uh, doesn't work that well, uh, but phase contrast uh, is well suited for phase contrast microscopy. So the, the idea here um, is that um, there's going to be a phase change in the light ray as it encounters the specimen, uh, and that's produced by light diffraction, which we've talked about before. But we also talked about in the last modules uh, that our human eye cannot detect these phase changes. And so we have to convert these into an amplitude change. And so what we're going to talk about in this module is how phase contrast microscopy works uh, and how it produces this conversion. But I want to start with interference. So we talked about interference before, but let's uh, review a little bit. We talked about two types of interference. And the first one we're going to talk about is constructive. All right, so if I plot amplitude, I'll just call that A, and then I look at two different waves, and then there's going to be a scattering event. So this is our material. So I can draw the sine wave like that, and another one. All right, so the wavelength is from peak to peak and that's lambda, and the amplitude is A. All right, so those are kind of the two important um, characteristics. So this is wave one, this is wave two down here. So initially, both these waves are in phase, right? The peaks line up vertically, the minimums line up vertically. So that's what we mean by in phase. So now we want to look at what happens when we uh, encounter uh, an object. And so here's our object, our scattering event. So when it encounters the object, we're going to look at the other side. And we're going to see that it looks something <coughs> excuse me, like this. And this. So again, the peaks are matching up. The minimums are matching up. The wavelength is the same and the amplitudes are the same. So in um, whatever happened here, both waves maintained uh, this type of relationship where the peaks match up. So they're still in phase. In phase still. So what happens is that what we see in the result uh, is actually a combination. So if both of these had an amplitude of A, then the resulting amplitude of this is 2A, and the wavelength is the same. So basically, uh, when these are in phase and they diffract, the resultant wave is the sum of all these amplitudes. So if we have two waves, it's the sum, and we get 2a. And it, uh, and it keeps multiplying like that with the number of waves you have. So we have a combination of two or more waves with the same wavelength, and they're in phase. So that's the example of constructive. So now let's look at destructive. So again, we've talked about this briefly, but let's sort of go back and, and revisit destructive interference. So we have the same amplitude. So destructive interference. We have amplitude again, same same way. And we're going to look at 
two waves that are initially very similar. Again, amplitude, wavelength. Both of those are the same. And now we look at this scattering event. And in this case, the result of that scattering event, A is the same, the amplitudes are, or sorry, the, the wavelengths are the same, but it's such that the peaks and valleys, so to speak, are now no longer matching, right? Here, they were in the same phase, so they're not shifted at all uh, from peak to minimum. But now, the peak here matches up with the, the uh, minimum of the next and vice versa. So what happens there when these, diff in the process of diffraction, this results in zero amplitude. So that's the, the kind of the other extreme. So these are uh, out of phase, and they are um, by a factor of the wavelength divided by 2. So that's the special case where uh, the amplitude goes to 0. Uh, they can still be out of phase in other um, ways that aren't factors of this, uh, and that would, uh, minim that would lower the amplitude compared to the case we saw before with the addition of amplitudes uh, for constructive interference. So the two examples I've showed you here, constructive and destructive, are the extremes. And there's going to be um, uh, a variation between uh, completely in phase, completely out of phase, in which the amplitude um, is slightly lower. So this is this interference is important for understanding the optical arrangement in phase contrast microscopy uh, because it's going to uh, the the arrangement the equipment involved in phase contrast microscopy is going to be built such that we get these variations we have constructive and we have destructive and that way we see these phase differences and we do it through diffraction and these are our results. Uh, through diffraction we either get uh, the ampl amplitude in, uh, magnifying or decreasing to zero. And so we can use that and the phase differences we see in the material come out in this amplitude difference which we know we can see with the eye. So that's what we're going to look at next with the arrangement. All right, let's now talk about kind of what makes phase contrast microscopy different than normal light microscopy. And there's some special equipment that comes with this. And so that's what I've got here on the, the screen. So the first thing I want you to sort of uh, draw your attention to is what we call the condenser annulus. So I apologize if it sounds like something that Indiana Jones searched for, but that's just what it's called. Um, so you'll remember that the condenser is part of the light system. So we have the light uh, coming to the condenser, but here we put this annulus, which basically blocks out light except for at uh, these uh, outer uh, ring, this outer ring. So what that does is that now that it goes through the condenser and through the condenser towards the specimen, we have the specimen only being illuminated from these oblique rays. And so you'll remember this is very similar to what we had in dark field imaging. So this is basically a similar configuration and a similar idea to dark field imaging, where we have oblique rays uh, illuminating the specimen. It's only coming from this central ring. So that's an important part, this condenser annulus. It's placed in this, again, uh, front focal plane um, of the condenser. All right, so light passes through um, this arrangement, through the specimen. Um, if it doesn't 
diffract, um, then that that diffracts and that that doesn't diffract is going to be uh, considered different in this arrangement. But I do want to walk you through uh, the other um, parts of this first. So we've got the condenser annulus, which is new. Um, the condenser specimen objective, these are all the same that we've seen before, uh, but we do also have this phase plate. And so this is what's going to help us um, look at diffracted and non-diffracted light uh, to project in the image plane. So I've put this uh, diagram here. There's also another diagram you can uh, look at that's basically the same, just drawn a different way from our textbook. Uh, so both of these will show you the arrangement. And again, these two new things are the condenser annulus and the phase plate. All right, now let's look at the function of this phase plate. And I put a little bit more detailed drawing of it and how it works here on the right side. So let's take a look. So again, uh, light is coming in at these oblique angles. Um, and if it doesn't diffract, it's going to follow a similar path, right? So it's gonna come out here, you see, and go through the objective. And then uh, once it reaches this phase plate, you'll see that the um, focal points of this ring of light uh, is uh, along this uh, area, this ring in the phase plate. So it passes through the ring that's again in this back focal plane of the objective lens. And what this ring is, is this whole thing, this phase plate, it's a plate of glass, uh, but it also has an etched ring. So that ring is etched and that reduces the thickness. And you can see that over here, the, uh, the ring here has uh, less thickness. And so it enables the waves to go straight through this um, ring. So basically it's going through at, at a, you, know, you can think of it as faster, right? So that the phase uh, is uh, a, a lambda over four more than um, what it would be so that it advances further. So that's one part. So that, that's the, the non diffracted light. So if it doesn't encounter anything in the specimen, um, then it's going to go straight through. And that light is represented by this red or the S here as the undiffracted light. So now in the specimen, if something changes, right, we have a difference in that material and it is diffracted, uh, going through that specimen, just like we saw in the previous uh, portion with the, um, the uh, object in the way of a uh, wave, then it's not going to go through the same path that we see here and going through that phase ring. It's going to go through and get def when it gets diffracted, it's going to go more towards the optical axis. So basically along here where this is kind of red. And so that is the, what we call this D wave, and it's gonna pass through the center. And that center is the same thickness as the rest of the plate, you know, the ring is thinner. And so that diffracted beam gets delayed because it has to go through more light. And so it gets delayed by the same uh, factor, this lambda over four. So now we've got diffracted light going through the center, getting delayed, uh, the undiffracted light speeding through at uh, lambda over four. And when these combined uh, uh, past this phase plate, they're going to diffract. And if you can kind of notice here, the sum of those two waves um, plus one fourth minus one fourth, that's going to give us um, a value of lambda over two. And that's the condition for completely destructive interference that we saw previously. So by making the layout here such that we have uh, 
this goes straight through really fast, this get delayed, this gives us um, completely destructive interference. So we have diffracted light and non-diffracted light and it completely, um, it's completely destructive and therefore we wouldn't see a resultant wave here. So this is really like the dark image uh, in dark field, right? And so the inherent nature of this image is going to be a dark image because we have a condition here for um, destructive interference because the amplitude is low. So what's going to happen is that this is our default, but there's going to be variations in the uh, phase delay, right, due to diffraction because our specimen is different. And so that is what's going to cause the variation in contrast, right? So if this uh, is diffracted in a uh, slightly different way and it doesn't completely equal that lambda over two, then it's not going to completely cancel out. And so we're going to get some amplitude and that's going to give us the contrast between this inherent background of a dark image. So those variances between how much phase shift there is, is going to give us the change in uh, contrast that we visually can see through the arrangement here, right, at the image plane. And so that's how phase contrast image uh, results. That's the, the process. These are the two um, sort of unique uh, pieces that have to be involved, and then the variation is going to be a result of that change uh, in phase.